Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. You're listening to episode 105 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Nearly 800 years ago, one of the greatest intellects in Christian history, no, not Jimmy Akin, St. Thomas Aquinas, oh. <laughs> was born. He became one of the greatest theologians of all time, and he wrote on many subjects. Some of these include topics that we would consider today a cult. So what did St. Thomas Aquinas have to say about these mysterious topics? What did he have to say about astrology, crystal healing, amulets, demons, ghosts, and psychic powers? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, it seems like an unusual, a little different topic for us. Not unusual. This is right in our alley. But how are we going to proceed today? Well, one difference between today's episode and what we usually do is that we're looking at the thought of one man, St. Thomas Aquinas, on a bunch of different subjects. This is, episode is kind of what you might call St. Thomas Aquinas's mysterious world, or <laughs> since I'll be serving as your guide, it could be Jimmy Akin's St. Thomas Aquinas's mysterious world. One of the things that I realized when I started researching this topic is that Aquinas has a lot of really fascinating stuff to say about the occult. And it isn't just on a single topic. He covers all kinds of occult things, like the ones you mentioned, astrology, crystal healing, amulets, and stuff. So the current mystery is unusual in that we're not looking at a single subject. It's a bunch of different ones. And because of that, there's so much fascinating stuff to cover that it won't all fit in a single episode. So what we'll do today is talk about St. Thomas and his times. We'll be looking at his place in Catholic thought, at his life, how he understood the world and the forces that operate in it, and how the concept of the occult was understood in general in his day. Then, in our next episode, we'll proceed to look at what he said about all the individual occult topics like astrology and crystals and stuff. Also, we won't be doing the usual faith and reason segments. Partly, that's because we're going to be looking at the you know these multiple mysteries, and it would be hard to have a faith and reason segment on each one. And you know, he he wrote almost eight hundred years ago, and the science has changed enormously in that time. In fact, the scientific revolution hadn't even occurred in his day. So Aquinas's scientific beliefs are of historical interest, and we will be touching on them but they aren't the cutting edge science of our own day. What's really interesting here is what Aquinas has to say from the faith perspective. And so the faith perspective will tend to dominate our look at these mysteries. And in particular, we'll be looking at how the principles, the faith related principles that Aquinas used in his analysis of these occult topics, how those same principles can be used today. So, Jimmy, we often talk about our personal connections to various mysteries. What's your personal connection to St. Thomas Aquinas and this subject? My academic training is in philosophy, both as an undergrad and as a grad student. And so I studied a lot of Aquinas. I spent uh, multiple semesters studying his work, and I'm a big fan of him as a philosopher as well as a theologian. My own training is in what's called analytic philosophy, which involves the careful analysis of concepts and arguments. Analytic philosophy involves making a lot of distinctions. So whenever you hear me say things like, well, it depends on how you understand this term. If you define it this way, you get this result. But if you define it this other way, you get this other result. That's essentially what analytic philosophers do. And it's not just that my training is that way. It's also just the way my brain is wired to work. And Aquinas does that all the time. If you read his most famous work, the Summa Theologiae, 
you'll see him making those kind of distinctions just all the time. So in college, I took to Aquinas like a duck takes to water. His philosophical method really appeals to me. And not just the fact that he makes lots of distinctions. I also really appreciate the way his philosophical method draws on different types of sources. In Aquinas's day, there was a rediscovery of a lot of ancient sources, such as the works of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, uh, many of which had been out of circulation in Europe for a long time. These works had been preserved, though, in the Muslim world, and many Muslim authors had written commentaries on the works of Aristotle. For example, some of the most famous commentaries were written by a man named Ibn Rashid, or to use his Latin name, Averroes. In Aquinas's day, both Aristotle's works and the Muslim commentaries on them were being translated in, into Latin, making them accessible again to European scholars like Aquinas. And some in Europe were very skeptical about that. They didn't want to have anything to do with Aristotle's ideas, or even less did they want to have anything to do with the Muslim commentators on Aristotle. But Aquinas' attitude was all truth is God's truth, and we shouldn't reject an idea just because it doesn't come from a member of our tribe. Instead, we should give it a fair hearing and look at the evidence and the arguments. In other words, we ought to apply St. Paul's principle from 1 Thessalonians 5, test everything and hold fast to what is good, or to put it another way, sort the wheat from the chaff. That made Aquinas a kind of eclecticist, someone who didn't just draw on one school of thought, but who was open to insights coming from different directions and who would then test and incorporate the good ones into his own thought. And that aspect of Aquinas's method also just really appeals to me. And as people who listen to the show know, I'm an eclecticist too. I draw on lots of different types of sources of information and then seek to integrate them by faith and reason. So does that make you a Thomist? To draw a distinction, it depends on what you mean. If by Thomist you mean a person who appreciates St. Thomas's overall method and uses it a great deal in practice, then you could describe me that way. But that's not how Thomist is normally used. Normally, when you hear people describe themselves as Thomists, they mean more than that, not just that they appreciate and use his method, but that they have adopted a lot of the same ideas that Aquinas advocated. His writings were very influential, especially in the Dominican order. And so a school of thought grew up based around his ideas known as Thomism. It involves the specific set of ideas that Thomas was personally convinced of and that his followers at least broadly share. Many of these ideas are metaphysical, which means that they have to do with how the world works at the fundamental level. For example, Aquinas and other philosophers of the period followed Aristotle in saying that matter is the principle of individuation. Uh, that's kind of a funny statement if you've never heard it before. But what they mean is that it's the matter that a thing contains that makes it one individual within a species that's different from another individual in the same species. Uh, for example, suppose you used a Star Trek transporter to make two identical copies of a dog. You know, maybe it's a pink dog and it's got a, it's got a horn. horn and yeah, <laughs> we've seen that same episode. Yes. But the thing is, these two copies of the dog are identical down to the molecular level. So what makes one dog different than the other? Well, Aquinas and various other thinkers of his day would say it's the fact that they're made of different matter. The matter in one dog is different than the matter in the other dog. So you have two individuals of the same species and thus matter is the principle of individuation. It's the thing that makes these two different individuals. And that's fair enough. But what happens if you try to apply this principle to species that don't have matter, like angels? Well, Aquinas would say that since angels don't have matter to cause them to be different individuals within the same species, each angel must be its own species. And that's what a classical Thomist will say each angel, its own species. But I'm not convinced of that. In part, 
I'm not convinced of that because of the way Scripture uses language. Scripture puts angels in different classes, like the cherubim and the seraphim. And that at least sounds like different fundamental kinds or types, which is what a species is. It's a kind or type within a greater class. So like dog is a species within the greater class animal. And it looks like seraphim and cherubim are classes or species within the greater genus angel. The biblical data thus suggests something different than what Aquinas's philosophical argument would. And the philosophical argument is not certain, not to me, because it presupposes that matter is the only principle of individuation. I can buy that matter is the principle of individuation in material things like dogs. And since our senses only directly detect the material world, that's the principle of individuation we'll be aware of. But how do I know it's the only such principle? Maybe in the spiritual realm, there's another principle of individuation. So one seraph can be different from another seraph Well, they both belong to the same type or species of angel, namely seraphim. And, you know, this is just one example. There are other various points where I'm not convinced by Aquinas' arguments. So while I love Aquinas and I love his overall method, I wouldn't describe myself as a Thomist the way the term is ordinarily used. I'm I'm too much of an eclecticist. I adopt elements of Aquinas' thought when they seem well-supported by evidence and argument, but I'm not committed to assuming he's right on any given philosophical or theological matter. And the church is okay with with people not being Thomists, right? Oh, yeah. The church does not expect one to slavishly follow the thought of St. Thomas. In fact, in this episode and next episode, we'll be looking at some opinions of St. Thomas that you definitely don't have to believe as they've you know, been overcome by developments in science and doctrine. Uh, sometimes, even in theology, St. Thomas is wrong. For example, his understanding of the Immaculate Conception was incorrect, although not as incorrect as is often thought. Furthermore, you know, what the Church really teaches is doctrine, not theology or philosophy. Uh, The Church has official doctrines or teachings, and Catholics are expected to believe those, but theology goes beyond doctrine. Anything that is, properly speaking, a matter of theology is a matter of opinion rather than official Church doctrine or teaching. Consequently, one is free to agree or disagree with theological opinions that St. Thomas expresses. For more on the distinction between doctrine and theology, you can check out my book, Teaching with Authority, which we'll have a link to. I I go into that prominently in that book. Similarly, the church doesn't teach a single school of philosophy to be correct, and philosophical ideas that aren't repeated in church doctrine are also matters of opinion rather than doctrine, and so one is free to disagree with philosophical opinions that St. Thomas expresses. Despite all that, he is extremely reputable and influential. He is an orthodox expositor of church teaching, taking into account the fact that, you know, there have been 800 more years of doctrinal development since his time. His theological and philosophical opinions have been very useful and influential in supporting and fleshing out Catholic teaching. So while we're not under an obligation to adopt the theological and philosophical opinions of St. Thomas, the Church does hold him up as a model of how to do theology and philosophy. For example, in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, St. John Paul II writes, The Church has been justified in consistently proposing St. Thomas as a master of thought and a model of the right way to do theology. He went on to say, Profoundly convinced that whatever its source, truth is of the Holy Spirit, St. Thomas was impartial in his love of truth. He sought truth wherever it might be found and gave consummate demonstration of its universality. In him, the Church's magisterium has seen and recognized the passion for truth. 
that impartial love of truth, the willingness to seek truth wherever it can be found, is something that speaks really powerfully to my own heart, and it's the driving principle behind this podcast. So as far as I'm concerned, St. Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Yes, I think St. Thomas would love these p- mysteries of UFOs and other things. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about St. Thomas himself. What, what can you tell us about his life? Well, he was born in the year 1225, although we're not exactly sure when. He was born also in Italy to a wealthy family. And as a younger son, he was expected to go into religious life, and his family wanted him to become a nice, respectable Benedictine. In fact, his uncle was a Benedictine abbot, and the family expected that St. Thomas would eventually achieve the same kind of prestigious position as abbot in his ecclesiastical career. But when he was 19, Aquinas decided that he wanted to join the crazy new Dominican order or order of preachers instead of the Benedictines. At this time, the Dominican order was very new. It had been founded in 1216, you know, just around nine years before St. Thomas's birth. And St. Dominic himself, the founder of the Dominican Order, had only died in 1221, just four years before St. Thomas's birth. So it was all very new. And as a result, it was not yet very prestigious, in part because it was also a mendicant order, meaning that it avoided owning property or accumulating significant financial resources, and its members often lived itinerant lifestyles and survived on donations from the people they served. In fact, the word mendicant, or in Latin mendicus, meant beggar. So the mendicant orders were the ones whose members survived by begging. Not a high class thing to do. And <laughs> so this did not go over well with Aquinas's wealthy family. So to keep him from joining that beggar order, they did what any concerned family would do. They kidnapped him. They then imprisoned him in a castle for over a year, hoping to get him to become a nice, respectable Benedictine. Allegedly, Two of his brothers even hired a woman of the evening to tempt him, though I'm not sure why that was supposed to encourage him to become a Benedictine rather than a Dominican. In any event, it didn't work because St. Thomas reportedly chased the woman out of his room with a red-hot poker he grabbed from the fireplace. And once the family saw his determination to become a Dominican, they eventually gave in and, and let him go ahead and do that. But... Rather than openly capitulate to his wishes, they found a way of saving face. St. Thomas's mother arranged for him to escape through a window in the dead of night. That way, the family could say they didn't give him permission. He just escaped and ran off to join the circus. I mean, the Dominicans. <laughs> St. Thomas then went to study at the University of Paris, or the Sorbonne, which was then a new university. In fact, it had been founded less than 100 years before, and it was one of the first universities in the world. He also ended up teaching later on at the University of Paris and in Naples, Orvieto, and Rome before coming back to teach again at Paris. During this second period in Paris, Aquinas became involved in a controversy over Aristotle and his Muslim commentator, Averroes. Both Aristotle's and Averroes' ideas were becoming popular among certain theologians in Paris, and not all of those ideas were in harmony with the Christian faith, so St. Thomas wrote several works against them. Also, in 1270, the Bishop of Paris condemned several Aristotelian and Averroist propositions as being contrary to the faith. In 1272, Aquinas was given permission by his order to start his own school, and so he founded one in Naples, Italy. The next year, in 1273, he's said to have had a couple of mystical experiences. According to one account, a sacristan at his monastery came upon St. Thomas in a chapel, and he was levitating off the ground 
in front of a crucifix with tears in his eyes. The figure of Christ then spoke to him from the crucifix and said, You have written well of me, Thomas. What reward would you have for your labor? And Thomas replied, Nothing but you, Lord. In December of the same year, 1273, while he was saying Mass, St. Thomas became very still and silent, and afterwards he stopped working on his most famous writing, the Summa Theologiae. He'd written the first two parts of it and part of the third part, but then he stopped. And when his companion urged him to get back to work on it, he said he couldn't because everything he had written now seemed like straw to him. However, fortunately, after his death, the Summa was completed using material that Aquinas had previously written for a commentary on Peter Lombard's famous work, The Sentences. Lombard was another medieval theologian. He wrote this famous work called The Sentences, and other people wrote commentaries on it, including Aquinas. And since Aquinas's commentary on the sentences covered the same topics that the third part of the Summa did, later people could use Aquinas's commentary on the sentences to finish the Summa Theologia. So we have what would have basically been the, the full thing. Just how solid is the case for these two mystical experiences you, you mentioned here? Well, it's not as solid as I'd like, because Aquinas didn't seem to write about them. For example, our knowledge of the levitation incident apparently depends on the word of others, and the details of what happened vary from one account to another. One account that I've read attributes this event to being witnessed by a sacristan, but another account I've read says that three of his confreres saw it. Here's what G.K. Chesterton said about the incident in his book, St. Thomas Aquinas. Somebody seems to have caught a glimpse of the sort of solitary miracle which modern psychic people call levitation, and he must surely have either been a liar or a literal witness, for there could have been no doubts or degrees about such a prodigy happening to such a person. Notice the degree of caution that Chesterton displays in reporting this. Somebody seems to have caught a glimpse, and he must surely have either been a liar or a literal witness. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement of the event's factual accuracy. And here is what the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on St. Thomas Aquinas says about the same event. It is not surprising to read in the biographies of St. Thomas that he was frequently abstracted and in ecstasy. Towards the end of his life, the ecstasies became more frequent. On one occasion at Naples in 1273, after he had completed his treatise on the Eucharist, three of the brethren saw him lifted in ecstasy, and they heard a voice proceeding from the crucifix on the altar saying, Thou hast written well of me, Thomas. What reward wilt thou have? And Thomas replied, None other than thyself, Lord. Notice that in this version, they say that the brethren saw him lifted in ecstasy. But that's an ambiguous phrase. It doesn't have to mean floating above the ground. Lifted in ecstasy could just mean caught up in a vision. And some accounts of the incident, like this one, don't explicitly mention levitation. Consequently, at least at the present stages of my research, I can't rule out the possibility that the account originated as a misunderstanding. Perhaps one or more people saw St. Thomas having a vision, or they thought he was having a vision, and they reported that he was caught up in a vision or lifted in ecstasy, and it got taken to mean that he was literally floating off the ground. What about when he supposedly had a mystical experience while saying Mass? It seems that something definitely happened during the Mass, but the question is whether it was a mystical experience. For this one, we're dependent on the testimony of his companion, Father Reginald of Piperno, who urged him to get back to work on the Summa. But once again, the details of exactly what he told Father Reginald vary. According to one account, he responded to the request to start writing again by saying, Reginald, I cannot because all that I have written seems like straw to me. That's consistent with him having a mystical vision of heavenly realities that made human words seem pale by comparison. 
but it's also consistent with other hypotheses, like maybe an argument suddenly occurred to him while he was saying mass, and this argument would undermine a key principle of his system of thought, and he didn't know how to refute it. On the other hand, according to another version of his response, Aquinas said, I can do no more. Such secrets have been revealed to me that all I have written now appears to be of little value. And that version definitely does make it sound like he had a mystical vision. But how are we to know which account, if either, is the more reliable one? I'd love to have a scholarly book on the history of St. Thomas's life that ran the accounts of both of these mystical experiences back to the original 13th century sources so that I could read what was said, preferably in the original Latin. But so far, I haven't been able to find one. All I found are popular non-scholarly biographies and books that focus on his writings, so they only give like a brief overview of his life. And thus, they don't give the kind of 13th century sources we'd need to really verify what happened here. Perhaps a listener, though, can recommend a scholarly biography that does go into the earliest accounts of these mystical experiences. I can certainly agree that... Uh... I've had experiences where I've been at mass trying to pay attention and something occurs to me that makes me <laughs> go go distracted for a moment and uh, uh, have new thoughts about important things, usually related to faith, I hope, but not always, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Thomas Howard even wrote a book called When Your Mind Wanders at Mass. Exactly. So what happened to St. Thomas after these experiences? He didn't live very long. Aquinas had been in ill health, and in 1274, Pope Gregory X held the Second Council of Lyon in Lyon, France, to try to bring about reunion between Latin-speaking and Greek-speaking Christians. He summoned St. Thomas to attend this council, but on the way, in fact, while he was on the Appian Way outside of Rome, that's the same highway St. Paul was martyred on, St. Thomas struck his head on a tree branch and became critically ill. He was taken to the monastery of Monte Cassino, where he then died on March 7th in 1274. He was around 48 or 49 years old, and we're not sure which because of uncertainty about the precise time he was born. It's a bit ironic because Monte Cassino was a Benedictine monastery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened after St. Thomas's death? Did, did he have a smooth path to canonization? Actually, no. In 1277, the Bishop of Paris, same, same guy who'd earlier condemned some Aristotelian and Averroistic propositions, condemned a new set of propositions. And this time, they didn't just come from the writings of Aristotle and Averroes. He also included 20 propositions from St. Thomas. And that really hurt St. Thomas's reputation. And it was an illustration of how many people in his day thought that Aquinas had included too much Aristotelian thought in his own writings. When his canonization process did get underway, the devil's advocate, or the guy whose job it is to argue that a person should not be canonized, complained about there not being sufficient miracles worked during Aquinas's lifetime, which, you know, may give us reason to be cautious about the levitation incident if that wasn't said, oh, here's a miracle that we can be confident of. In the end, though, he was canonized by uh, Pope John the Twenty Second in 1323, just 49 years after his death. And after that, his reputation continued to improve to the point that in 1567, just under 300 years after his death, St. Pius V proclaimed him a doctor of the church. That seems like a good point where we could uh, take a moment and thank our patrons. We, we always love to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Neil P., Rhonda M., Meg P., Devin T., and George and Wanda. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. So, Jimmy, what theories do we have for the, uh, the various <laughs> uh, elements of St. Thomas's life? 
one of the theories we need to talk about is what we mean by a cult, because it didn't mean the same thing in Aquinas' day that it means today. And as part of looking at that, we'll also be looking at how people in his day understood the world, both in terms of how it's physically structured and what kind of forces are at work in it, because they saw a lot of occult forces in the world. Then in our next episode, we'll look at what Aquinas said about particular occult subjects, including astrology, crystal healing, amulets, casting lots, demons, ghosts, the evil eye, mm. and psychic powers. So when, when we talk about the occult, what do we mean by the occult? Well, today people associate the occult with astrologers, mediums, witches, things like that. It's limited to weird and usually sinister supernatural things. But that's not what the term occult meant in Aquinas' day. In Latin, occultus meant anything that was hidden. Anything that people didn't know about or understand was occultus. But that meant the world was filled with occult or hidden things and forces that people didn't understand. And people recognized that these things weren't automatically contrary to the faith. I mean, after all, they were part of God's world. God was the one who set up the world, and he created many things in it that are just hidden from man's knowledge. Sometimes God would reveal these things through the prophets, and thus God himself would announce occult knowledge. Thus, Scripture says, this is from Second Maccabees 1241, it says that God reveals the things that are hidden, or in the Vulgate, he reveals the occulta, the hidden things. So in Aquinas' day, occult had a neutral meaning. Just because men didn't understand something, that didn't mean it was evil. It just meant something we don't really know much about. So how did people's view of the world differ in Aquinas' day from ours in the 21st century? In the Middle Ages, it was thought that the things on earth are made of the four classical elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Everything else was a mixture of these four. Also, the elements were not thought of as being made of atoms. There had been uh, a couple of Greek philosophers, Leucippus and Democritus, who had proposed the idea that matter was made out of atoms, but it was not it was very much a fringe theory. And actually, it remained a fringe theory for a very long period of time. Atoms were not actually proved to exist until the early 20th century with Albert Einstein. Hmm. So even in the 19th century, you had a lot of physicists who thought, ah, these atoms are they're a nice bookkeeping trick, but they're not really real. So in Aquinas' day, it was thought that you could just have a hunk of matter, let's say stone, made out of earth, the element earth, and you could divide it and just keep dividing it and dividing it and dividing it, and you'd never reach a smallest unit of matter. Opinion was divided, though, about what the stars and planets were made of. And of course, the planets were considered to be stars. That's what they were originally called planetes in Greek, which means wanderers. And so they were the wandering stars that didn't just go around in a circle the way the other fixed stars did. And people debated what they were made out of. In the Summa Theologia, Aquinas notes that some people thought that the heavenly bodies, the stars and the planets, were made out of the same four elements that things here on Earth are. But other people thought they were made out of a fifth element called ether. It was also thought that the Earth was a sphere, so they didn't believe in the flat earth, but they thought the earth was a sphere at the center of the cosmos. The heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, were thought to surround the earth in a series of transparent concentric shells or spheres, kind of like those Russian matryoshka dolls, you know, where you have one inside of another. Well, they thought, okay, here at the center, we've got the earth, and then the next, there's a sphere around the Earth that's transparent, and it ha holds the moon. And then there are a series of other spheres outside of those that hold the, st the sun and the other planets and finally the stars. Everything below the moon, or what they called the sublunar world, was subject to change and corruption. 
But since the heavenly bodies endlessly moved in their orbits, seemingly without change, they were thought to be incorruptible. Outside of the spheres was the highest heaven, sometimes called the Empyrean heaven. It was thought to be a realm filled with light, and Aquinas identified it as the region where the angels and the saints dwell. The spiritual world, thus, was also real, and it contained what Aquinas referred to as separated substances. And that's not a term that's familiar to us today, but what he meant by that is substances or things that can exist even though they're separated from matter. Substance to us tends to mean a stuff, you know, like tapioca or something is a, or plastic is a substance. But for Aquinas, taking substance in the philosophical sense, it meant a thing. So you're a substance, I'm a substance. And since our souls can exist while separated from matter, our souls are separated substances, at least after we die. But God also exists apart from matter, and so do angels, and so do demons, and so the spiritual world contains these separated substances, God, angels, demons, and disembodied human souls. So what about the forces that people thought were at work in the world? How were their views different than ours on that? Modern science recognizes four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. There may be others, and late, lately we've got some hints that we may have had some early detection that may or may not pan out about a fifth force. But those are the four that we recognize today. In Aquinas' day, they didn't have any of those concepts. Since people didn't believe in atoms, they didn't know about the nucleus of the atom, and so they didn't have any concept of the strong and weak nuclear forces. You need atoms, the con you need to believe in atoms and know about the nucleus before you're going to be talking about those. They also, and this is more surprising from our perspective, but they didn't have the concept of gravity. People knew that physical objects here on Earth fall down, and they knew that the planets move up in the sky, but they didn't use gravity to explain those facts. As we talked about in episode 83 on the case of the missing universe, it wasn't until the 1600s that Isaac Newton proposed an invisible force that caused objects with mass to attract each other. He thus explained both the motion of objects falling down here on Earth and the motion of the planets in the sky with the same force. This was the first great unification in science when he realized that one force could explain both of these phenomena. And he named this new force gravity from the Latin word meaning heaviness, gravitas. And as we mentioned, he got pushback because the Aristotelian physics of his day held that bodies could not influence each other unless they were connected by a physical medium kind of like you can't hear someone speaking unless there's air between you and that person. But gravity was supposed to work even across a vacuum with objects exerting spooky action at a distance on each other. And so Newton was criticized for proposing this magical occult or hidden force. By contrast, Aquinas back in the 1200s, held that stones fall towards earth because they contain the element earth, as he explains in his letter on the occult workings of nature, which is an interesting little read. People in Aquinas' day also did not have the concept of electromagnetism. They knew that you could make what we would call static electricity by rubbing a piece of amber. You know, you rub amber and then you can use it to like attract the hair on your arms with the static electricity. So they knew you could do that. They didn't have the concept of electricity, but they did know you could rub amber and, and, and get it to attract hair. Uh, they also knew about lightning bolts and they knew that certain kinds of eels, which we would call electrical eels, can give you a shock. But 
in the 1200s, they didn't know that all of these were explained by one thing, that they were all manifestations of a single concept. That realization also wouldn't happen until 1600, when the English scientist William Gilbert coined the word electricity. He based it on the word electron, which was the Greek word for amber. And so we got the concept of electricity that united all of these different phenomena like what happens with amber when you rub it, what happens with an eel when it doesn't want you to play with it, and what happens with lightning in a thunderstorm. Similarly, people had known about magnets, you know, since ancient times, but they didn't know that electricity and magnetism are two sides of the same force, which we today call electromagnetism. That was another great unification of science, which happened in the 1800s when Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell united electricity and magnetism. In Aquinas's day, people knew that magnets attract iron, but they didn't know how or why, which meant that magnets had an occult or hidden force to them. In fact, in the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas cites magnetism as an example of an occult force. He writes, Now, in the physical order, things have certain occult forces, the reason of which man is unable to assign, for instance, that the magnet attracts iron. So people in the 1200s knew that magnets had a hidden force that allowed them to attract iron. They knew that amber could have a hidden force that would attract the hair on your arms. They knew that certain eels have a force that can shock you, and they knew that there's a force that makes things on Earth fall down, and they knew that there's some force that moves planets in the sky, but they didn't have the concepts of electromagnetism and gravity to explain these things. From, from their perspective, they were caused by multiple different hidden or occult forces. And that shows you just how broad the concept of the occult was in Aquinas' day and how neutral its meaning was. You know, just because something had an occult power like a magnet didn't make it bad or of the devil. It just meant people don't know how it works. So that brings us to the end of our discussion of St. Thomas's idea of the occult. And uh, that seems like a good place to stop and pick up next time when we discuss uh, the specific occult forces. Yeah, we'll we'll look at how Aquinas then was faced with all this sea of occult things. How did Aquinas go sorting the good from the bad in it? Excellent. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer the listener uh, to tie them over till next time? Uh, we'll have a link to G.K. Chesterton's book, St. Thomas Aquinas, which we mentioned. We'll also have a link to my book, Teaching with Authority. One book that we're going to mention in our next show is by Alexander Boxer. It's called A Scheme of Heaven, and it's about the history of astrology and mathematics. It's a, a very interesting read. Believe it or not, astrology was one of the key things driving mathematics forward. We'll also have a link to an article that I wrote about St. Thomas Aquinas in the occult. We'll have the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as a link to his Summa Theologiae and his letter on the occult workings of nature. Excellent. Very good. I'm looking forward to uh, the second part of our discussion. So uh, that brings us to our mysterious feedback, and we have some great feedback from listeners on our episodes on David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Uh, the first feedback comes from Sean Orr, who wrote uh, on YouTube, I lived in and around Waco in the early to mid-80s. Fairly certain I crossed paths with him then. He would come out to some of the jam sessions. I recalled Vernon being his name, and that initial photo they showed on TV was very familiar. Ironically, he was one of many people I met in that area that had peculiar and passionate beliefs. Well, as someone who lives in California, there are a lot of people here who have peculiar and passionate <laughs> beliefs as well. But it's great to hear from someone who actually met David Koresh and some of the Branch Davidians. And yes, he did have an interest in playing music. I'm not surprised he would come out to some jam sessions back then. Jimmy, you mentioned strange beliefs in California. Wasn't there a famous philosopher who said that uh, when they tilted the U.S., everything loose rolled into California? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've I've heard it described many different ways, not all of them flattering. <laughs> okay. So Carlos Lamb writes on YouTube, 
Note that when the first raid on the commune ended, the ATF agents were almost out of ammunition at the point of the ceasefire. When the ATF withdrew, they could have easily been mowed down by the Davidians, but the Davidians held their fire. That's a that's a good point. Uh, we didn't really go into it just for length reasons. There were a lot of things we could have gone into. But the when the ATF did their initial raid on the commune, the gun battle went on for so long that the ATF was running dangerously low on ammunition when they negotiated a ceasefire. And the Davidians kept the ceasefire. They were not trying. They were it is evidence they were defending themselves that they weren't being a bunch of deliberate people who just wanted to deliberately kill other people. They could have done that if they had wanted, and they didn't. Okay. Uh, Victor Olson writes on YouTube, What the Sam Hill, Jimmy Aiken? This episode was like a cross between Tiger King, a Tarantino movie, and Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> well, I have I haven't seen Tiger King. I've seen a few Tarantino movies, and I've seen a little bit of Beavis and Butthead, but I'll take that as a compliment. It certainly is a weird <laughs> pair of episodes. <laughs> I've seen Tiger King and Tarantino movies and a little bit of Beavis and Butthead, and that's probably not a bad comparison. Chateau Mojo on YouTube writes, I remember the siege just from living in Texas at the time, but I found your information plain shocking. I had no idea. Crazy ATF. Great example of what can go wrong with law enforcement agencies. Should be required viewing at Quantico and other training spots. And I believe that this is definitely used as a, an example of what not to do at various uh, government training facilities, including at the FBI and the ATF these days. Mm. Uh, then Thomas wrote on Facebook, there is no doubt that the cult members started the fire as the planning of it is caught on tape. So I replied to Thomas on Facebook and I said, thank you for this link. I have read it and will give it further study. The first impression is that many of the things, and he included a link to a story that dealt with this and had a, a, a reported excerpts from the FBI's listening devices. But I said, I've read it and will give it further study. The first impression is that many of the things it reports do not constitute proof. For example, some of the references to fire are clearly references to gunfire. Others are consistent with the surviving Davidian stories. The number of quotations that would count as weighty evidence is only a small portion, and we are told that the tapes they're taken from are largely incomprehensible, or at least were until they went through audio processing. One would want to listen to the cleaned up version to see how accurate the proposed transcript is. In this episode of Mysterious World, we don't come to a firm conclusion either way about how the fire started. But thanks again and God bless you. And in the further resources, we'll have the link that Thomas provided so you can read it for yourself and make your own judgment. I would urge you in doing that, though, to be aware of the facts that I just mentioned. This is taken from tapes that were said to be largely incomprehensible before audio processing. We don't have the, the the link, at least, does not have a link to the tapes, so you can't listen to them yourself to check the accuracy of the transcript. And various things in the transcript are either consistent with what the surviving Davidian said or they're ambiguous. So if you're looking for the smoking gun, so to speak, about what started this, the fire, exercise critical thinking. Uh, I, as someone who works with audio every day, uh, I would caution yeah. against uh, pareidolia, which is uh, the, that hearing or confirmation bias, even hearing things yeah. you expect to hear that might not actually be there. So that, right. that's there, too. All right, Jimmy. So what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, uh, we have a Dead Sea Scrolls theme for our mysterious headlines. So let's unroll that. Some Dead Sea Scrolls have turned out to be fake. Mm. In fact, all of the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Museum of the Bible turned out to be fake. Now, these fortunately are not the classic Dead Sea Scrolls that everyone is familiar with. Those were dug up or found, I should say, back in the 1940s and they started coming to light in the 50s. Those are all those are genuine. These are newer reported Dead Sea Scrolls that were supposedly came to light after the year 2002. So these are recent things. It's the post-2002 scrolls that are suspect. On the other hand, some early Dead Sea Scrolls from the 1950s that were thought to be blank 
turn out not to be blank. Mm. They're uh, little fragments of stuff that they th- the, the ink on them had faded so much that the scholars who examined them in the 50s said, oh, this is blank and put it aside. But they've gone back and looked. Turns out there is faint ink there that we can now bring out. And so that may give us some new information if they can assemble these into meaningful texts or fill out bits of other texts, because it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. But that's really exciting news because it could add to or clarify our knowledge of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And because these were sitting in a drawer or a box for the last 70 years, we know these are authentic. Nobody was faking these or it would have been and it would have been impressive at the time. <laughs> these are genuine new discoveries. And it's amazing how the the original looks so blank and the characters under the new imaging is so clear, like yeah. so like, like a, a modern printing. Uh, great. Those are some great, uh, great headlines. So uh, at this point, we want to turn to the listeners and ask for your feedback on today's episode. What are your theories about what St. Thomas Aquinas, about Aquinas himself and what he had to say on the occult and uh, his views on the occult. So you can let us know. Maybe you maybe you know about a scholarly biography that gives us the Latin from those original mystical experience witness accounts. That would be a great feedback to have. And if you do have any of that, uh, you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page or send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, next episode, we're going to be looking at what Aquinas said on individual occult topics, including astrology, crystal healing, amulets, casting lots, demons, ghosts, the evil eye, and psychic powers. Excellent. So, folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World Bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com, where we have links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in all of our shows. Uh, You can also find those links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>